Yeah, welcome to my talk. I will talk a little bit about uh, the launch and early orbit phase of our satellite, the Flying Laptop satellite. The Flying Laptop satellite is a small satellite developed at the Institute for Space Systems at the University of Stuttgart. And uh, while I'm the only one currently standing here, of course, there's a whole team behind it. I've only relatively recently has in the last year joined the Flying Laptop team, so please uh, also think of all the generations of PhD and other students who made this possible. So the Flying Laptop, that's how it looks like from the outside. You can already see the three main payloads of the satellite, uh, each one camera with a a spectral filter, so we can image in uh, red, green, and near-infrared uh, spectra. Uh, and you can also see uh, the main outside components, the uh, golden um, data downlink uh, directional antenna, and also one of the two uh, telemetry telecommands antenna on the front of the satellite. Uh, I will not so much talk about the satellite itself, but uh, mostly about how uh, the last months until uh, the launch went and uh, yeah, more the procedure. If you have more questions about the satellite itself, you can uh, see me at the uh, CSOC assembly and I will be happily to answer your questions. So that's how it looks. Uh, if you remove the outer panels, uh, you can see inside uh, the baffle and optic uh, assembly of the three cameras, but also lots and lots of subsystems tucked away inside the satellite itself. On top you see two star cameras, which are used to determine the attitude of the satellite uh, when it's in orbit, so we always know where we are looking at. So, uh, what is done in the last months after the satellite is basically completed. It's uh, mostly testing, testing, testing. So here, for example, since we are no CubeSat, we were not launched inside a container where we just had to prove that we won't damage the container. Uh, we were launched uh, mounted directly to the upper stage of the rocket. So we had to prove that when they were going to eject us from the upper stage, that we were going uh, to move as planned, not crash into the stage itself. So what was done was uh, a separation test was performed here in Moscow. Uh, what you see here is a structural uh, mass and test article of our satellite, which was mounted on a uh, replicate uh, of the launch adapter and then just basically ejected inside a hall. It was mounted on strings, so it won't crash into uh, bystanders or something like that. But uh, I was told it was pretty loud and spectacular. Uh, another thing is with this test article, uh, the upper stage of the rocket we flew on, it was a, a Soyuz with a frigate uh, upper stage, uh, is basically very, very automatically in its operation. So when we say we will launch a satellite, and then don't deliver the satellite, they have a problem because then the mass distribution of the upper stage isn't correct anymore. And when they burn, they have too much mass left on the upper stage, things like that. So we had to deliver this test article uh, months in advance. So in case we wouldn't deliver the real satellite, they would have flown this mass dummy and then ejected it at the correct orbit. It wouldn't have done much because it's really just a test article with some solar panels mounted to it. But at last, uh, uh, at least the mission would have been successful for the other satellites. So, of course, another thing we've done a lot is training. Here you can see our mission control center at our university. Uh, as you see, the most important parts are glowing signs for the different uh, subsystem stations. Um, yeah, but what we basically did is uh, we have a replica of our onboard computer in a rack in our uh, so flight software testing facility. And when we are sitting inside this uh, control center, we can't really discern if we are currently communicating with the real satellite or the onboard computer inside the box in our laboratory. So for, our, our, for us, the spacecraft operators, uh, it was a really, really lifelike training. But the thing that was different was, of course, the test 
director was injecting failures all the time in the in the system. So we had a sensor mal malfunction uh, or a deployment of a solar panel uh, didn't go as planned. And so we had to interpret the telemetry we got from the uh, onboard computer engineering model and then try to find a, a way to mitigate the problems that occurred. Um, Sometimes the problems were even during testing unattended. At some point, our flight director said he saw error uh, reports that were consistent with somebody taking an axe to the flight onboard <laughs> computer and just destroying it. Uh, apparently, the computer that was used to uh, direct the different failures and modes uh, had a buffer overflow in one of the Chrome tabs that were also open, and that made the whole real-time simulations not so real-time anymore. So uh, yeah, that was also something we encountered. But besides that, um, we were able to uh, pretty much train all contingencies. And uh, we were very, very, um, yeah, it's very, very certain that at least from our side, everything was uh, ready for launch. Um, what we might also be able to tell uh, the, the, the software we use to uh, do live operations uh, on our satellite is this gray windows you can see on a couple of uh, desktops here. That's the software also used by the DLR or ESA to control the satellite. It's called SCOS 2000. So you already know when you name something 2000, it wasn't developed yesterday. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's basically the same thing they use. So we were able also to train our students and other people uh, in a way that was representative of uh, other operation center in case they wanted to do that as their future profession. So the ground stations we used during our launch and early orbit phase were not only our own ground station at the IRS in Stuttgart, but also some of the ground stations the DLR is using for uh, their satellite operations. So the background was that also our ground station was built up specifically for our satellite. And when we would have used that for the initial operation in orbit, we would not only have uh, uh, it would not only have been the first time we operated our satellite, but also the first time we operated our ground station with the satellite. So to mitigate this risk, we uh, also used the, the Weilheim ground station pretty nearby. So it didn't really offer additional coverage of the satellite, but they had a bigger dish. They were uh, more experienced in operating it, so we could use that. And then uh, because our uh, satellite is in a polar orbit, so it will uh, and one part of the day cross our ground station from north to south. And then when the Earth has moved half a turn, the satellite will pass the ground station from south to north. And in between, we have long times, many hours of no contact with the satellite. We also used additional ground stations, which were uh, near the poles here in northern Canada, Inuvik ground station, and then on the Antarctic continent, the Gars O'Higgins station. So those are also operated by the DLR, and we were able via a protocol called Space Link Extension to connect to the DLR ground station network, and from our operation center in Stuttgart, just use their ground stations for the communication. But from our side, it didn't really make a difference. The only difference was that the antenna operated in Stuttgart didn't operate an antenna, but communicate via telephone with the uh, network operator of the DLR. Another ground station which we are currently using um, is the uh, GFZ ground station in New Orleans. Uh, this is a ground station from the Geoforschungszentrum Potsdam, and they uh, kindly provide us with about two passes per day where we can downlink data. So while in the ground station network I previously described, we use it to up and downlink data. The New Orleans ground sta station is only used to downlink data, so to get more images per day and also have another backup possibility in case our ground station has a problem, we can always downlink data over the New Orleans. That is the ground station, uh, well, at least the ground station antenna we have in Stuttgart. It's a 2.5 meter parabol parabolic dish with a sub-reflector in the middle. And we use it to communicate telemetry, telecommand to the satellite, but also get our 
image data back, which is on a separate channel, but also in the S band, so 2.xx gigahertz. <coughs> So, uh, yeah, as you might have imagined, uh, when we are talking about polar uh, ground stations, they have different problems than we have. So, for example, here in O'Higgins, at one point uh, during our LEOP operations, we had to skip a pass because the, the winds were too high, they had a snowstorm. So, <coughs> that's nothing we encou encountered in Stuttgart. Snowstorms are very rare. But otherwise, it was a very, very... Uh, reliable ground station, the one in O'Higgins as well as Inovic. Yeah, just as an impression, that's how it looks like in, in your other zones. So while in O'Higgins they have a special antenna which can withstand the environment, in your other zone they have domes to protect it. <coughs> yeah, and uh, after all the testing was, good, uh, was uh, done, we know we can operate our satellite, we know that we can talk to all the ground stations that we were going to use. It was finally time to say goodbye. <coughs> so we had two boxes, one for the satellite and one for all the ground station equipment, which was going to fly via Moscow to Baikonur in Kazakhstan. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, one of us, uh, the team leader, uh, wanted to uh, always stay with the satellite. So he also took the same plane to Moscow and people later to Baikonur. Um, but yeah, that was for many of us the last time we, we saw the satellite when it was uh, put into its transport crate. Another thing which was a little bit different for our satellite was that due to the construction of its battery system to keep all the strings equally charged, it had a constant uh, drainage current even when it was uh, switched off. <coughs> so after a couple of days, we had to recharge the battery during this storage period. So about every every other week, people uh, flew to either Moscow in the first days or then Baikonur to perform recharge operations on the satellite. The good thing was more people had a chance to travel to uh, Moscow and Baikonur and see the facilities there, which were really quite impressive. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the satellite finally arrived in Baikonur, uh, final operations were done. So, for example, the real launch adapter here was mounted to the bottom of the satellite with all the pyrotechnic bolts inside, the spring mechanism. And then the satellite was picked up by crane to be mounted on the upper stage of the rocket. So here you can already see the mounted, um, the mounted separation adapter. And what's also interesting here on the top, you see the skirt around the crane because the crane is mechanical. It will might always shed some dirt or dust. So there is this skirt this, uh, to protect the satellite underneath. Of course, the satellite, as you can see, was still very much wrapped in protective covers. Here, also over our laser downlink, we had a cover to ensure that in case everything went wrong and the laser went on, then uh, it wouldn't hurt any bystanders. So this was also only removed uh, after mounting. That's how the upper stage looked like. Here in the bottom you have the fuel tanks of the frigate and then uh, on the top of it with the engine you have a construct out of tubes, metallic tubes, which hold all other satellites. So most of the satellites were mounted on top, for example, uh, uh, on top of the structure, for example here our satellite, the flying laptop, uh, and some of them were mounted into the structure from the other side. Uh, what you can also see on this next picture is many, many of the satellites in total, if you count them, there were over 70 satellites on the upper stage. Most of them were CubeSats, so they were put inside these uh, deployer boxes here, which were just then going to open in orbit and through a spring mechanism push the satellites out. But there were also quite a few bigger satellites, so beside ours, for example, also one, uh, one from Berlin and uh, other uh, state-funded or university-funded satellite projects. And then on top, the, the orange compartment is the main passenger, that's the Canopus Earth Observation Satellite from, from Russia, which was uh, yeah, the main customer of the, of the launch. So after everything is mounted, of course, you have to protect it from the elements and also from the launch conditions. 
So next step was to put the fairing onto the upper stage. Uh, what you might be able to see, the fairing is on a on a sled mechanism here, and then uh, somebody had a manually operated turn handle, which then uh, step by step uh, moved the fairing onto the onto the uh, upper stage. As you can see, the upper stage here is mounted mounted on a swivel mechanism, which was able to uh, where you were able to mount, uh, integrate the upper stage vertically and then tilt it into a horizontal position to then encapsulate the satellites. So, and then finally, uh, the encapsulation is here nearly done. Um, this was really the last time anyone saw our satellite <laughs> on Earth. Um, I might be able to show you a picture later because someone saw it in space, but uh, yeah, that was at least up close the last time anyone saw our satellite. Afterwards, the upper stage is mounted to the Soyuz rocket, and of course, it's uh, hauled via train to the launch pad. Um, I think it's the, the, the oldest launch pad in Baikonur, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but as you know, the Soyuz rocket has been in operation for many, many years. So uh, all the, the procedures which are done are very, very well tested. So, and I hope this works. Looks good. So, of course, finally, uh, the day we've all been waiting for, I for one year, many others for many more years, is uh, liftoff time. So a couple of us were, of course, on site in Baikonur. Uh, the others watched the live stream, which uh, had about the same quality. Um, I see some room for improvement. But yeah, it of course was the, uh, I would say, most stressful day <laughs> in, the, in the whole project. Uh, you see the engines igniting, support structure swinging away, and then the, the rocket slowly, slowly lifts off the launch pad. So of course we were know what was supposed to happen next. Um, the upper stage has several periods of uh, activation where it activates its main engine to uh, bring the different satellites also in different orbits, so they were not all released into the same orbit. And uh, the thing was that the upper stage only has uh, communication uh, capability with Russian ground stations. So we were going to be ejected uh, not over Russian ter territory, I would say about south of India. But then afterwards, the upper stage was to pass again Europe and there would be ground station contact. Um, the thing was, our satellite was going to pass over us first. So we knew that the separation was successful, if it were successful, before the Russians knew it from their upper stage. So really the first time everyone had was able to able to tell if the launch went right was when we would get the signal over the Weilheim ground station. So of course everyone was uh, was very anxious. Uh, we sat in a sm relatively small group in our uh, auditorium. Um, it was not planned to make it big big event out of it because there might always be something that goes wrong. So the big event was postponed until uh, we knew the satellite was uh, well in orbit. But yeah, of course, many people who worked in the past and present on the satellite were present at that day and we were all waiting for the signal. So we, as I told you, uh, we are going to use the Weilheim ground station, but the Weilheim ground station, as you saw on the map, is very close by to our own. So what we did, of course, was also try to receive the signal with our own ground station. And th as it turned out, our ground station was in a little bit better position to receive the satellite, so we saw it on our spectrum graph that the satellite was all alive and well and was transmitting before we got data from Weilheim that uh, the launch was successful. And of course that was great, everyone was uh, celebrating. I went to bed because I had night shift for satellite operations, but I of course stayed up until I knew that I had to come at night. I mean, I might have been able to stay at home, so why, uh, why miss this opportunity? So what followed is the LEOP phase, that is the phase where we uh, do perform s first switch-ons on all the uh, subsystems of the satellite. Uh, here, for example, you see the moment when we uh, uh, deployed our solar panels. As you might have seen on the pictures, the solar panels were tucked 
onto the body and held down uh, by mechanisms. And uh, we wanted to see if uh, we were able to deploy them correctly. Uh, we had a little bit of problem there because uh, the solar sensors, which we normally use to determine which direction the sun is and then turn the satellite to the sun before deploying the, the solar panels, uh, are by design partially shaded when the panels are tucked onto the sides of the satellite. So the idea was, okay, uh, basically our solar arrays are very big uh, and expensive solar sensors, so we will just use them to determine where the sun is until we have deployed the solar array. To do that, however, um, we need to measure a current on the solar panels. And the mechanism we use to, um, to charge our battery has a logic that if the battery is uh, nearly full, it will cut the connection, um, almost cut the connection to the solar panels. So we don't measure any uh, relevant current anymore. And uh, the system performed so well that every time the satellite came out of the shadow of the Earth, where it was, let's say, uh, decharged the most, not ma much, but the most, uh, it was already fully charged before it went and go gone over our ground station. So we were not able to live, uh, uh, get live data from the solar panels if we are really pointing to the, to the sun. Uh, we did some work around there. And at some point, we're so, so sure that, we, yes, we were pointing to the sun. Everything was as expected that we deployed our solar panels. And uh, how did we were able to tell that something was deploying? We looked at the rotational rates of our satellite. And there we saw that there was a disturbance when the panels deployed. And of course, afterwards, we saw signals from the panels. But this was the first indication that, yeah, there was something mechanically going on. Of course, we saw the currents to the melting wires of our hold-down mechanism. But here we saw that, yes, something was going on, something deployed, at least one of them. But of course, both of them deployed. It was very, uh, very good. But yeah, then uh, that was the next big milestone, basically, on our way to fully operating the satellite. Also important, especially of course for public relation, was the first picture we took with the satellite. And uh, as was man mandated from project uh, leads, of course it had to be Stuttgart, the first picture. What else? And uh, this is a picture from our panoramic camera. So uh, this camera is not a scientific camera with high resolution. This is more a uh, yeah, general course uh, directional camera which we use to uh, see if we are pointing in the general right direction and also produce pictures like this to uh, demonstrate the capability of the satellite in orbit. But yeah, that's why uh, basically it's whole uh, Baden-Württemberg on this picture. It's not very, very high resolution. So this is a picture we took with our uh, main scientific camera. This is Port Arthur in, uh, in near infrared. Well, it's in Texas, but this is a image taken in the near infrared channel of our uh, camera. And we were able to also prove in our LEOP phase that um, the camera systems were performing then as expected. And uh, yeah, so basically everything, mostly everything worked. We had small hiccups as there always are, but uh, the subsystems worked much better than anyone was, uh, yeah, was uh, hoping, basically. So another couple of things we saw. Uh, as you might remember, there was the big uh, solar eclipse happening this year, and uh, we flew through the shadow. So what we saw in our telemetry data is that uh, we have uh, basically two things. We have a brightness indicator on our uh, solar sensors, and we have a sun flag, which just tries to determine, is there a sun or am I in shadow? And both of them were consistent. When we flew through the shadow of the moon, we had a short cut out in, uh, in solar coverage. So we were uh, able to uh, confirm, yes, the, uh, the solar eclipse was taking place. Normally, what you see is this long term, well, it's about 45 minutes per period uh, change between I'm in sunlight, I'm in shadow, because the, uh, the satellite on its uh, near polar uh, sun synchronous orbit is, uh, is uh, flying always almost at 12 o'clock, about 11.30 local time on the equator, and then same time at night, so PM uh, on the shadow, on the dark side of the, of the Earth. So we normally see this, this uh, switch from brightness to, to eclipse. Which you are, what you are also able to see is that the period of sunlight is longer than the period of shadow at the first 
uh, glimpse, you might imagine that they should be fairly equal when you are in, on the, uh, on the uh, noon midnight line of the Earth. But because we are in 600 kilo kilometers altitude, we have a little bit longer sunlight until we go into the shadow of the Earth. That's why we have here a longer sun period than eclipse period. We also saw other satellites. As I told you, we had lots of other satellites on our, orb uh, on our uh, upper stage. And uh, some of them, at least one, was uh, deployed in the same orbit we had. And uh, it also had a similar frequency for one of its transmitters. So uh, in the middle, you see the normal, um, the normal telemetry uh, spectrum we expect every day. Uh, we, at this time, knew that another satellite from the TU Berlin was going to test the uh, uh, S-band trans transmitter for the first time. So of course, we looked extra careful. And yes, we saw the carrier in our uh, ground station equipment. At first, uh, before that happened, there was a little bit of worry that maybe if both satellites transmit at the same time, there would be interference. But we had no problems receiving our own data. So no, uh, no worries from that point on. Yeah, and uh, as I see, I'm uh, much faster <laughs> than anticipated. Uh, what happens next? So we had our first soft uh, software update in December, uh, which takes about a week because our uplink is only one kilobit. Uh, we have very, uh, very high uh, downlink bandwidth, but uh, for for image data, but our uplink is only one kilobit. So it takes a long time to to upload if you only have 10 to 30 minute chunks of uh, up upload periods. Um, but yeah, that, that was successful. We rebooted our onboard computer with the new software, and so far, no new bugs were discovered. Um, but yeah, also, uh, one thing that will uh, happen during the Congress is that the data downlink system, so the signal from this directional antenna, which transmits on 2.408 uh, gigahertz. Some of you might recognize this. This is uh, partially in the Wi-Fi spectrum. Um, will transmit towards Leipzig. So uh, some people will try with their uh, Wi-Fi antennas in software defined radios, see if they can see at least uh, a dip in the waterfall. If you want also try, come to us. I will, glad, I will be glad to help. And because this is in the amateur radio uh, spectrum, we also try to participate in the typical amateur radio tradition. So we have a QSL card for anyone that uh, can uh, prove us that he received the satellite, be it just the carrier or even bit, uh, bits or data from the satellite. Uh, because we have 7 megahertz of bandwidth, it's, it's not that easy to really get meaningful data out of the signal. As I said, we have a 2.5 meter dish. But uh, if you are able to receive it, you will get this nice QSL card to add to your collection. So uh, I think. That's all I have for you today. Uh, if you have specific questions, please ask. Otherwise, you can find me at the assembly. Thanks. Um, so uh, what is the cost associated with this? Of course, there's a, there's a lot of sponsoring, I assume. There is a lot of uh, research. But uh, j j just uh, apart from your investment in time, of course, and emotion, but well, it's a very long running program, and that alone drives up the cost. I uh, really don't have a total figure, but it's, uh, it's not cheap. Uh, and so the, the next satellite will very uh, likely be uh, smaller, not 120 kilograms like this one, more like 30 kilograms. So it will be easier to finance the satellite itself as well as the launch. But uh, that's currently very much in its infancy, so we don't have a concrete next project. Uh, and uh, for the lift, uh, you have to pay for the company or uh, the organization who makes the, the actual uh, carrier service uh, to launch it. Did you have a, a price per gram or something like this? Uh, no, it's as far as I understood it, because I was not involved in contract negotiations that were the higher ups. But uh, it's mostly a case by case basis. Of course, there are some rough figures you can take. But uh, since there are all these extra services, for example, separation tests, other services associated with the satellite, it's not uh, that easy that you can say you launch uh, 104.56 kilograms and then you know uh, yeah. what kind of uh, So you, you can't shave cost by, OK, uh, I uh, have to save 10% uh, of the cost. And so I just uh, reduce the mass by 10%. This I don't work. think that's, yes. that wouldn't be possible. I mean, uh, even if you would, let's say, be 10% lighter, we very likely would have paid the same or roughly the same amount. 
That's uh, unfortunately not that easy for this type of satellite. As I said, uh, for CubeSats it's a little bit easier. There you can get a rough per unit uh, estimate which corresponds to about one point something kilograms of mass. But uh, since we were a real small satellite without a CubeSat dispenser and all these things, uh, it was more complicated because of the extra verification procedures we had to do. And um, for the hardware, how do you uh, do? Uh, how do you source this hardware? Do you go to manufacturers and say, "Okay, uh, we can't pay military stuff, but uh, please send us the, uh, the best ten samples, and we put it in our our own climate uh, lab"? Or uh, how do you, how do you filter these units? Uh, that depends. Uh, some of our um, some of our components, especially the ones we developed ourselves, uh, use more or less commercial off the shelf uh, components where we bought multiple and then did some qualifications on some of the samples. Uh, for most of the very critical onboard components, for example, the onboard computer, uh, we use uh, space qualified components. So there, uh, we paid the price to uh, have a reliable uh, system. So um, it's not really a normal laptop. So sorry? it's not really a normal laptop. <laughs> no, no, not at all. The name flying laptop uh, is um, mostly a, a remainder from the beginning of the program where it was thought that this satellite will just test a new onboard computer and mostly nothing else. So we just name it flying laptop. And so the first publications done on the project were uh, done using the name flying laptop and uh, Due to let's say brand management, the name was kept, even though the the satellite underwent some significant changes down the road. Any more questions? Uh, what is your lifetime expectancy? Um, the satellite doesn't have any orbit uh, control capability, so no propellant or uh, engines on board. So when we do nothing. We would expect that to re-enter within 25 to 30 years. Um, we currently have a planned operation phase of two years, which I would say would likely be ex extended because all components on board behave very, very well. So we have no reasons uh, uh, to doubt that we will be able to extend it by a couple of years. Um, in case anything would uh, go really, really wrong with the satellite, let's say we don't uh, have any command capability anymore, then uh, we would be near the limit uh, on orbital debris mitigation, which is 25 years after operations in orbit. So to really be sure that we, that we achieve this, this limit, we have a deorbit mechanism mounted down here in the, in the launch adapter, which is basically a big, big sail which extends when the timer runs out. So uh, what we do is uh, every time we communicate with the satellite, we send a timer reset command so it doesn't deploy. But uh, I think it's a couple of weeks or months until the timer runs out. So this is only really a contingency procedure in case the, the satellite is uh, unusable, basically. Of course, uh, should there be a, a time where we ourselves see, OK, we have lost many onboard systems, there is little point in continue operating it, uh, then we can also deploy it ourselves. But uh, I would say that's unlikely for the near, near future, the next couple of years. Do you, run a up, do you run a crunch up on that uh, timer or somebody have to remember to s reset it? Um, what happens every time uh, uh, a satellite uh, comes into uh, reach of our ground station is there is a certain procedure that's executed. That's the so-called spacecraft green procedure. That's just a basic check. There was no major errors during the last uh, time we didn't speak to the satellite. And part of this procedure is basically reset the timer. So uh, we have scripts which scripts which uh, prepare these command stacks for each pass, and then they automatically insert the uh, reset timer command. But it's still then manually released by the uh, spacecraft command controller. Uh, but uh, this is a special thing uh, that you bought off the shelf for space flight? Well, it's uh, developed by a university in uh, Tokyo, and uh, it was basically part of the technology demonstration mission of the satellite to, to demonstrate that this, uh, this sail works. As we said, we are on the fringe of uh, 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 do, yeah, fulfilling the debris mitigation anyway, so uh, it's just on top. Uh, 
um, and um, uh, so, yeah, um, as there is a lot of debris, uh, um, as I heard, uh, around in space, um, and as you can't maneuver uh, this spacecraft, um, how do you uh, uh, think the risk is uh, that you collide with something which you can see that will happen in perhaps five months? Uh, uh, we are monitoring, of course, or being monitored from ground, and um, if you are a satellite operator, there's a service uh, uh, by I think the Joint Space Command, something like that, in the US or North America. And we get a, a notification every time something passes within a couple of kilometers of our satellite. That happened already a couple of times. Um, so for example, also another satellite from our launch passed us. We saw that it was another satellite from our launch because the relative velocity was near zero. So no damage there, even, th even if it would crash into it, it was very, very, very light touch. Um, yeah, okay. On the other hand, uh, on the altitude we are, there are these uh, remains from the Chinese anti-satellite test, which happened a couple of years ago. And we also had a, let's say, a close flyby of one of these debris. And they are on a velocity that could damage us. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not yet that much of a problem because that was still a couple of uh, hundred meters away. So uh, we were not in a real risk of having a, having, having a collision. We, of course, will take a look at that. Uh, what we've done so far was trying to take pictures of the, of the debris or satellites that came by, but we were not able to produce a picture yet of that. So, uh, but if you would know that uh, there would be a certain uh, impact uh, to come, perhaps uh, some hours uh, into the future, you will self-destruct, or you will, uh, you would just uh, see that you get the last picture of the collision <laughs> collision coming in. Okay, perhaps a bad, bad, bad image for you, but. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, uh, with the last image, we would ha still have to download it to the Earth station, and we were not able to do it when we had a collision of this uh, kind of magnitude. Um, I mean, you could think about uh, putting the satellite in an attitude where its cross section is smaller, uh, if it's really that close by. But um, yeah, as I said, it's it's still unlikely enough that we don't have currently a procedure for this this worst of all cases. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I might be able to tell, uh, show you a picture of the satellite which was taken from Earth. Um, another branch in our institute operates an optical telescope in the US and they basically put their satellite, uh, their, their telescope tracking on our satellite path. So everything that was not our satellite uh, went uh, into these streaks on their image, on their long-term exposure. And then this, this small blob here in the middle was uh, what was very likely our satellite. So uh, of course, we took a picture back of their ground station. But uh, yeah, it was very nice that we will also be able to see it then at least one more time. Okay, then thank you for your attention. And as I said, if you are interested in uh, receiving the satellite tonight or in the next days, come to me. I will be glad to help you. Otherwise, you can find me at the CSOC assembly just behind this wall.